the journey that Mitch has been on is quite exceptional. But especially early on, be heads down, focus on one thing, do it well and do it elegantly. So before we get started, I just want to have a feel of how many of you have been to Rockstar before to one of these, uh, one of these events. Yeah, not everyone. I see some alumni that are not putting their hands off. That cannot be right. <laughs> we definitely been here before. But uh, just very briefly about Rockstar. So uh, we uh, invest and support in really early stage uh, startups. We are normally the first investor. And we really focus on giving access to capital, to market, to expertise, and to a global community that we build. And we do that in different programs. One we call with Mobile, where Misha was a participant in 2012 and also Smart Energy in 2014, we started that, and 2015, Digital Health, and then we recently launched uh, AI, so Artificial Intelligence, and here we really try to tailor the support for startups in different industries and around different technology focuses. So um, we thought it was super exciting to have a mission here today because uh, actually 90% of all startups fail, and uh, the 10% that didn't make it not all of them uh, become uh, super successful and end up being acquired by uh, a larger uh, corporation like, uh, like Oracle. Um, I don't have the exact number of that, but it's a lot less, probably one in 30. So the journey that Misha has been on is quite exceptional, uh, and especially in a, in a relatively short amount of time since he um, graduated from the program in 2012 to now being acquired by a big company in the US. So I just want to kick it off and welcome, first of all, Mitch, to you. It's exciting to have you here. Thanks for having me. So uh, I, think, I think it's nice for all of us just to get a good feel of, of who you are as an entrepreneur. Maybe uh, some background in terms of startup experience. What have you done sort of in, in your life in the starting of companies? Maybe start out with the general disclaimer. Let's do the disclaimer. Because obviously <laughs> we have a, that's a good one. Um, the, when you do a deal with a big uh, U.S. corporation, uh, there's a heavy disclaimer that we're also going to give to you guys that we cannot at any point talk, talk about the terms of the deal or any other um, sort of specifics around the deal. We can talk in maybe general terms. But it can leave. <laughs> <laughs> so anyone that's there to get that inside, uh, we will not be able to talk about that. Uh, but uh, we can talk in general about what it means uh, to go through an acquisition process. Uh, which I know you have some interesting stories about. Um, so, at any point in time, also feel free to raise your hand and uh, then we can do some questions. But I think it's nice to just get a little bit of feel of, uh, of you as an entrepreneur, sort of what you've done uh, startup-wise in your life. Yeah, sure. Thanks. Um, so, this worker is my first actual startup, startup venture backed, um, having employees, um, building an actual product. Before that, uh, I was a, a developer. Uh, sort of part time at an agency. Before that, I had a, I did have my own company with a, a high school buddy, basically building websites as we all did. I think at some point in our lives. Um, so yeah, developer uh, did computer science and business administration. So I'm like sort of a hybrid uh, in both in both areas. Um, so did business administration first, and then computer science uh, to do distributed systems. Uh, for my thesis, I went to uh, the University of San Francisco, uh, where I sort of experimented with containers. Um, I can go into what software containers are in a bit. So tell you a bit about the, about the product. Um, but yeah, so, so yeah, working my first startup background story is is um, at the agency. We had a lot of trouble basically bootstrapping our uh, the projects for like companies like Heineken uh, had to uh, basically. Uh, build up our uh, build and deployment scripts from, from scratch, uh, zero automation. So that was sort of inspiration on the one hand. And then for, uh, again, my thesis at USF, I built a platform for uh, a basic autonomous resource provisioning platform based on containers, depending on capacity and demand, spinning up more containers, spinning them down. Um, so obviously it made sense to combine these things. Um, so I came back to Amsterdam. Um, and yeah, started started a company around uh, basically building an automation platform that helps developers uh, develop, build, test, and deploy their applications uh, to the cloud. Uh, basically, so an automation pipeline is the best uh, example. Yeah. So, was there any feeling uh, in you um, growing up where you knew you kind of going to go on this path and start up a company? 
Is this some desire that you had early on? Yeah, it was definitely something that I always wanted to do. Um, when I was uh, doing computer science, uh, I was already sort of in contact with a lot of people in, in the Bay Area um, that are building their own startups. Um, eventually, one of them uh, uh, became our, uh, our CTO, uh, which is quite, quite awesome. Um, so yeah, I was always in touch with, with you know, the startup community in, in Silicon Valley, in San Francisco, and it was always something that I, I, I wanted to do as well. So let, let's, uh, let's talk about uh, Berg at the company that you then uh, ended up starting. Like, uh, from early on, did you already have a little bit of feel of where you were going with this company? Did you know what outcome you, uh, you wanted to foresee for it? You, you mean like monetary? Uh, in any kind of terms, yeah. if you wanted to build like a global company, or if you already saw like there was a certain path that you could, uh, you could follow? Yeah, sure. So, so the vision has always been uh, that we wanted to make developers' lives better. Uh, and you know, build build uh, the future of software development. Um, obviously, along the way, uh, things change and you know, different technologies um, come around that you, that you might want to use. So, so we had we had a path. Not, not I wouldn't say pivots, but we've had some some interesting segues into 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 other areas. Um, but yeah, the vision was always always there to build a, a, a gigantic company. I always said uh, that we uh, would IPO. That did not happen. <laughs> uh, unfortunately, but uh, we are now part of a uh, publicly listed company. <laughs> same thing. Same thing. So uh, that there's a you know being exposed to to the Bay Area uh, early on. Um, well, sort of what what did you take away with you the moment that you started you decided to start Burger? Did you already uh, had a good feel of this is also where I want to be? This is also where I want to be connected? Yes, yeah, I can talk a little bit about that. So, I, I, I don't, I'm curious to see who's been to, to sort of San Francisco and the Bay Area in, in general. Yeah, so I, I'd say like the energy level there is is, is quite significant. Um, like there's a, and you know it's an echo chamber at the same time. Everybody's working on startups and technology and programming and building the next big thing. Uh, but that does mean you know, there's a lot of stuff going on. And, and uh, you know if you're a developer or a designer or you know. Generally, on building products, it's 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 an exciting uh, area to be, you know, living in or or participating in. Um, so that was very infectious, to, like for you know, starting my own company. So so how much of because obviously you went in a you went in a space where uh, you you've been working in a de developer community that was primarily located in the in the Bay Area. Is that fair to say? Yeah. Do you think part of the uh, reason why Verka ended up in the direction that it did was also that you saw that this is really where the opportunities are, that if I want to build a global company, I also have to tap into some of the strength uh, and the communities there are in the, in the area. Yeah, sure. So I, I honestly think that um, uh, like a lot of, for a developer product, like a lot of these trends are being shaped uh, inside of Silicon Valley and, and, and San Francisco. Um, every, like a lot of people look, looking at that area of the world uh, to see where the next kind of programming language, framework, uh, cloud offering doesn't matter. Like are, are you know uh, evolving, um, so it made sense to, to to eventually like build up an office there and, and at least have at the very least have a close contact with um, you know other companies there. So you know, we partnered up with um, the Docker, for instance, um, GitHub, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And having having those close relationships uh, is very very valuable. Cool. So let, let's talk about that. Let's talk about the journey of uh, of getting uh, Verka off the ground because you've always been, as I know you, like extremely strong on, on, on networking and being connected to the right people. But you made a conscious decision early on, uh, I suppose conscious, to be to be in Amsterdam uh, and set out to build the team here, uh, while at the same time knowing that probably San Francisco, the Bay Area, will be the place where by far the most of your users will be located. Yeah, that's a, that's a that's a good point. Um, yeah, what's the thinking around that? Yeah, so I, honestly, I think that um, you know, Amsterdam, here, obviously, wages are cheaper, uh, but people are, are extremely talented, um, and I think that's been evolving over time as well. I think there's even even stronger talent, of course, out here uh, than it was uh, like a couple of years ago because you know, we're building companies, um, uh, you know, adopting these new technologies, doing more interesting things over time. So. It's like Amsterdam and Europe is getting stronger and stronger. Um, but it, it made sense for us you know, to keep keep the team lean, keep the burn rate low, uh, 
especially early on, if you just you build your product, there's no reason to, if you have nothing to, to be out there and just you know, spend thousands and thousands of dollars, uh, you know, on even rent uh, to to salaries to uh, to test your idea, right? So it was a conscious decision: build out the product here, get the first customers, uh, use it, I should say, um, and yeah, get the product market fit, and then move out there. Mm -hmm. What do you think would have happened if you would have uh, made a different decision and you would have gone uh, directly to the Bay Area uh, to kick off Urca uh, with the sort of the talent hunt that is also going on and the, with the kind of animations and competition? Yeah, so that's a good question. Uh, it depends. I'd say like the, the thing with, I'd say, developer-focused companies uh, and sort of infrastructure companies, yeah, these are like, not patting myself on the back or anything, but these are very hard products to, to build. Like it takes up a lot of resources, distributed systems, um, no offense to the mobile app people. Uh, it's, it's hard. <laughs> it's, it's a hard problem to solve, like uh, building any type of cloud, cloud product. Um, so it, it needs a lot of people, uh, and as such it needs a lot of money. So I think if we would have gone straight to, to SF and, and tried to build it there, I think we would have flamed out uh, Pretty, pretty fast. Yeah, was that? Was the was this well, feeling that that might happen? It wasn't necessarily a feeling because it was a conscious decision to like stay out here, build up the product first. So it wasn't. Yeah. It wasn't. Yeah. It wasn't really. It wasn't a decision. Do you reckon there would, would have been more capital uh, investment capital in, in San Francisco if you would have started? <coughs> I mean, the burger rate would have been higher. Mm. Would, have, would there have been more money there as well? Yeah. So that's a, that's a. That's a good question. Um, maybe. <laughs> um, I, I like. It, so this is another thing with 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 San Francisco and and and, um, and Silicon Valley is that it is an echo chamber, and you definitely, it, you, even if you have the right network of getting access to these people, they don't know you necessarily per se. Uh, and especially in 2012, I think it's getting better over time. But in 2012. And obviously, even before that, um, if you're not from SF or living or working, you know, five kilometers from the VC, they're not going to invest in you. Uh, they want to be in close, close contact with you. And again, like that's been getting better and better. But yeah, that would have been. So yes, there would be more capital available, but getting access to the capital, uh, I think that that would still have been hard. So let's uh, cover that, that uh, topic for, uh, for a moment, uh, raising funding. Uh, that's something that you've been, uh, you've been on for a couple of times, and actually quite successfully. Um, what, what, what would you say is sort of the, the main learning in that, in that journey of uh, going from the seed round to A to B, and um, you know, what, what can you take away from that? Yeah, sure. So I think, I think uh, there's, a, there's a couple of things there. One, obviously, sort of the dynamics change uh, as you raise more money, right? So if you do an angel round, you have a bunch of informal advisors, uh, investors um, that are not really involved in the company, hopefully. Um, if they are involved in the company, that's a red flag. Um, but, you know, when you raise, you know, a, a seed round maybe, or even uh, a series A, like we did, you start building up a board and you have to deal with board dynamics uh, and manage your investors more carefully. Um, and, and they have a say in where the company is headed, so that's, that's definitely something that's, that will change over time. So you have more, I'd say, more autonomy uh, early on. Um, but yeah, at some point you, you have more responsibilities and fiduciary duties to your, to your board and, and, and investors. So that's a difficult game to master from the, from the beginning, right? But what would you say, sort of, if uh, stuff you would like to have known, that you know today, that is really important about this, this whole exercise of going going fundraising, what would be uh, some of the things that you keep in mind? So, yeah, okay. so I think it, the challenge still is, um, and again, it's kind of biased from a, from a developer product perspective, there's not a whole lot of investors in Europe slash the Netherlands that understand uh, developer tooling, to be honest. So that's, that's, a, that's a hard thing to do, like raising, raising money on a, a topic that, you know, most of the people are not familiar with. Um, so I'm, 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 on the other hand, I'm obviously very 
grateful towards my investors that they, they, even if they no, don't necessarily always understand the, the underlying technology that they made the jump uh, to invest. Um, but sort of understanding that problem and, and, and making your pitch uh, accessible also to these people. It's always a hard trade-off, right? Because at the one hand, you, know, you do want people that understand your business and actually are able to contribute. But at the other hand, you also need money. Um, so that's, that's, that's a hard, hard challenge. Uh, the other thing which, which is sort of interesting is that could very well be, as was the case in our, uh, with our investors, that they might have expertise in a different area that you are lacking in, right? So for instance, we're pretty strong on the technology and product side, but commercially, you know, we, we just launched our commercial product in November of last year. I mean, that's something that we uh, purposely didn't do, but having, sort of in, having investors that are familiar with scaling commercial and marketing organization and how to implement that, and that that's, could have been something that you know, they, they would be able to help out with. So don't, don't undersell your investors as well. They might have skill sets that are useful in a different area. Nice. So let's let's talk about uh, sort of our general experience of going from very early stage startup now to be acquired by by Oracle. Uh, in uh, what we see with a, a lot of the startups going through the program, there's there's quite some learnings around what to do and what not to do. And you might come out on the other side with like specific mantras in life, that like things I'm definitely gonna stick to. Yeah. Um, in order, if I will ever do this again or just in life, uh, anything that. You could hold on to that now. This is definitely one of the mantras that you you stick to. I love mantras. Um, so one, and it's probably been mentioned uh, uh, before, but my my key key one would be focus. You should also be proud of the things that you're not doing, um, and, and focus on one specific element uh, of, that you want to try to solve, and solve that in a very well and elegant way. Um, so yeah, focus is important, especially I think I know, something that we experienced as, again as a developer uh, company is there's a ton of other companies that would love for you to integrate with their with their thing, and you get a lot of offers or uh, uh, requests for conference calls to start talking about these integrations and actually implementing them later on. But that, that's a huge time sink, like that, that costs a significant amount of developer time and. Um, and uh, and yeah, eventually money, of course. Um, so that's yeah, that's something to be wary about. Obviously, the the um, the promise that that's been made to you then is like, well, you're going to get exposure, and we're going to feature you on some kind of app store or integration marketplace. As uh, complete nonsense. You need, to, like, especially early on, be heads down, focus on one thing, do it well, and do it elegantly. Which is, I guess, sort of a segue in. For another mantra, uh, I, I, my sense is that like product design and the user experience of a product is becoming like increasingly more important. Um, so, doing doing things in an elegant way uh, is is a yeah something to, to focus on as well. And what we try to do. Um, if I'm not mistaken, you're a single founder, right? Yes. Um, would you start a company again as a single founder, or would you look for a co-founder? Yeah, do, yeah, being a single founder is, is, is hard. Um, you're doing everything ranging from you know, HR issues to uh, managing your board and investors to uh, product uh, to doing the dishes. You know, obviously it has its benefits. Uh, there's no conflict, only with yourself. <laughs> um, What's the worst one? Yeah. No, I... It has to. You have to meet the right person, right? Um, and that's always that's always hard. Uh, but I'm definitely open to for the next uh, next time. I'm looking for a job. Um, <laughs> uh, yeah, to to meet the right person or somebody in my network to, to go on to, on to the next adventure. It's not like I don't have a particular opinion about it. Okay. So I guess it's also about finding someone that uh, fits fits your style. And fit fits the ambition, right, that you're going for. Can we, uh, can we take sort of some time to talk about uh, the journey, like five, six years of working? What, what's, what's the style that you've been going at? I'm sure like if you're sitting here, it's nice to get a feel like, I know you as a super disciplined guy, right? But can we, uh, 
can we try to get a feel of uh, the intensity of, of this kind of journey and how has it felt afterwards? Do you feel that you need a vacation? Are you, are you ready to do the next one? Or like, where are you at? Yeah, everybody's recommending uh, that I should take a vacation. <laughs> <laughs> Never sign. Yeah. Uh, honestly, I, I, don't, I, I don't know how I look, but I don't feel tired. Um, and I'm actually quite excited about you know, what's coming next and, and the things that we're working on. Uh, obviously, we've our new friends as well. Um, in terms of style, discipline, um, I don't know what you're asking, actually. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm just trying to get a feel of like the 40-hour the, the work week or the 60-hour work week or somewhere in between with vacations and uh, um, yeah, because I suppose the reality and the yeah. So obviously, like the last couple of months has been different. I'd say, um, with, with little to, to no sleep, given the fact that um, uh, our new friends are in the Bay Area, uh, and we're over here, unless I travel that way, uh, the time zone really don't line up. <coughs> um, so yeah, it's, it, it, that's, that's been intense. I, think in, in, I mean, I, to be honest, like, I love what I do, um, so I don't really consider it work, to be honest. Uh, so you can find me in the office usually on the weekends as well, uh, doing things. Definitely more than 40 hours a week. <laughs> I gotta do that already. Um, qualities, I guess, well, you're a successful uh, startup founder, right? Mm -hmm. I think we can, uh, we can say that by now. Um, what kind of qualities do you feel that you need to have in order to get to the place that you, you managed to get to with your startup? Yeah, so I think we covered a, uh, actually a few of them. Um, I think net, honestly, like networking is, a, is an important aspect uh, and building up your network and uh, getting access to the right people that can help you along the way, different, different uh, stages of your journey. Um, I, I like to think I'm kind to my people and try to listen to them. You have to ask them, there's one in a room. Focus, focus on the user experience, uh, make things elegant, preferably zero steps. Uh, that's mostly it. The fact that you're building up a team and having people that have decided to join you on this crazy idea that you have, I think that's, that's an amazing feeling and an amazing thing to see. Um, yeah, that's definitely one of the, the, the things that I'm proud of. Um, you know, the fact that we've got an office full of people um, and the office looks great and everybody's working and everybody's excited about the things that they're working on. Um, you know, we've, in, in our particular case, we have an office in SF and an office in in London. That's that's a that's a pretty big achievement and something that I'm you know, quite proud of. And, and it's, it's yeah, it's good to see all these people buying into your delusional idea. Um, so that's that's definitely a high. Uh, there's no no. It's a great time, guys. Yeah, yeah, exactly. It is. Yeah. <laughs> so that's good. Yeah, there's no no real real lows, I'd say. Um, it's just hard work. Like it don't. That's, I guess that's maybe a piece of advice. Like it is really hard work. You, I, I, you know, as a CEO and, and founder, you have to start mastering different skill sets than just. I don't know if you're interested in tech, tech, just a technologist or programmer or designer. Like you're gonna have to do different things at, at some point um, during this process, and that's you, know, you have to master these different skill sets and you know be able to manage a board and. Uh, rogue investors and uh, employees that are crying. That never happened. Not a burger. All right, so I'm, uh, I've got a yeah, question. The uh, focus on monetization. When do you go from you know product and user experience to like monetization is actually the, the goal here? Is it from the first day or, or when is it? Depends. And then for, from your from your journey, when did it you know, did it start off with this is an idea I can sell or you know was this a great idea? But it sounds like it was more of a user experience that drove it. Yeah, slightly. Um, I think we you know we definitely wanted to nail the product. The other thing with monetization, like how do you charge for something, is is a, is, is a hard problem to solve because um, effectively, if you want an IPO. That basically means that you need to hit, like, like at some point in your life, $100 million revenue. 
right? What does that mean? Is that does that mean a hundred customers paying one million? Right. One million customers paying a hundred dollars. Like finding that that sweet spot, mm -hmm. and it that makes sense in the context of your your product. That is a very very hard problem to solve. Again, like like because on the one end of the spectrum, you're selling them kind of enterprise software, like long sales cycles. Um, you go into I don't know banks and, and start selling your stuff. On the other end of the spectrum, is it an API call? Like on a ten cents an API call. Figuring that out, um, that's a hard hard challenge. Um, and also then figuring out, like, coming back to like, how many people then would need to pay for this, right? right? And I don't think I think there's like 10 million developers in the world, something like that. Depending if you count the, the Microsoft people and um, <laughs> um, like, how do you how do you get to how do you get to that number? Right. So it's always it's a, by the way it's very interesting to, to look at um, the uh, like S1 filings uh, for companies that have IPO. Mm -hmm. So there's a, 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 a VC called Thomas Tungus uh, from Redpoint, and he does these analysis of, of the different uh, filings, mm -hmm. sort of what it means in terms of how many paid customers do they have, what's the average deal size, contract value, like, and then sort of applying that logic to you know, your own startup, and mm -hmm. that's, a, that's a useful exercise to do. And probably something, if you do decide to charge, figure out fast. By the way, the S1 filing for Snap was a bit weird. They don't uh, want to be profitable or didn't expect to be profitable actually. But the, the other the question that I wanted to ask is that did you change as a person in the past five years? And what I sometimes hear is that founders become a bit more, I don't know, maybe harder, stricter, mm. uh, bitter. <laughs> <laughs> You have to ask my people uh, if I've changed or not. <laughs> um, definitely more gray hairs. I don't know. If I, well, I don't know about bitter, but um, I do think, and you know, it's something that you should probably have like early on anyway. Just, you're gonna have to think big as a as a founder and like sell your vision. And I do think like over time you might be not arrogant, but increasing that confidence. Um, that's pretty. Maybe something that has happened over time. Yeah. When speaking with investors, how, how big is the ratio between vision and uh, core product that you've already built? How much do they invest into? How much do they buy into your vision? Yeah, that's a that's a good one. Um, for us, so we we definitely the product works, right? So that's that's covered, but it's mostly the vision in our case. Um, again, and that's something that we've been selling from being. This is the future of software development. Um, yeah. So how does a conversation like that go? Okay. So you're asking me how do I pitch? Oh, well, yeah. How, how do you? How do you? How yeah. do the VCs react, or maybe also look at specific places? Because I know here in Amsterdam, maybe some of the VCs here, it's a little bit different how they look at um, what they want to hear in a pitch. Yeah. Where, where does this work, pitching for the vision? Well, I think that it, it now works over here as well. It was initially, yeah, I think starting out, and it, again, like it's hard to sort of link these two things up, if, if, it's, if it's true or not. Is it, is it 2012 or it ends, um, and or being a you know, big person company with zero to no product? Or you know, just one of one of one of one of these. Um, but I, yeah, our experience was that it's hard at that point. It was hard for people to, to believe that you know this is a they don't believe I'd say like angel investment. And that's that again like that was for us in 2012. I don't know how it is right now raising money. Maybe you can tell me. Um, but that was a hard hard thing. Like they don't believe that this this could be really, really big. Uh, and I think I, I do think that perception has changed a bit. Also in terms, I'd say, the types of startups that people look at. You know, I, my sense was always in, in around that time that um, they, you know, they only invest in what they know. Like, so it has to, have to be a marketplace. 
preferably dealing with houses um, or used shit. <laughs> yeah, that's that's what they know, right? And um, I yeah, they can apply that math to to what you're doing. Um, yeah, you're you're out of out of luck. About uh, the moment that there is a, there's a buyer there, and then there's the the the, the, the what we call the investor, the, 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 your investor, your your species, and yourself are not in the, in the same direction anymore. Well, there are opposite interests because uh, perhaps they, there's a computer now, or all those kind of things to, to add up the value, to pump up the value. So, how did you prepare for that? Did you take an advisor, or, uh, because then? Or did you, did, you, did you advise by your NPCs? How did, how did that work? Do you understand the question? Yeah, I do. I'm, I'm contemplating if I can answer that question. Okay. Legally. Um, no, no, I don't care about the legal side. I, 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 no, I, no, you, you don't care. <laughs> <laughs> um, like, so. Like honestly, this depends on on the types of VCs you have, right? Again, like ours are extremely supportive, and you know, look at the landscape. You know, what are the possibilities, uh, and you know, what are the chances of that outcome? Like, it, it gets weighed, right? Um, I, yeah, I don't think at any time there was a, a sort of a conflict or or yeah or something of the of the sorts going on. I have one. I found it quite surprising that you had a PC or someone in the PC that I think led your deal or pushed for your deal and he ended up working for you. How did that happen? Yeah, so you're, you're talking about Wayne. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, Wayne, Wayne worked at um, uh, Notion Capital. Uh, so that was uh, sort of our second, second round. Um, was, well, how it happened, like he was so he was a board observer and we worked quite closely, um, basically on sort of the, the commercial strategy going forward. So not just the, the, the paid product, but also you know, how we're going to deal with developer marketing uh, um, and basically our go-to-market strategy. So having worked closely uh, with him, it made sense. So well, why not get him actually to join and, and sort of spearhead uh, effectively the commercial team? Um, so that's sort of how that came out. Like, yeah, we worked closely together and decided to work even more closely together. But the partners at Notion were like, sure, steal away, <laughs> fine. Uh, yeah, it was a, obviously we, we talked about that in, in you know, good faith and they, they were quite supportive uh, of that. And, and it, um, regardless of Wayne, in general, like in the VC world, it's pretty common to, uh, for uh, associates or principals to uh, work at another startup before they get promoted to partner um, somewhere else. So it's pretty. pretty yeah. um, one more question about uh, your team. You said you had multiple offices, one in London and also in San Francisco. What, what's your opinion about forming teams? And nowadays you see a lot of people working remote also. <coughs> Is that something um, what, yeah, what you also did or liked? Or would you want to have people in the room? Yeah. So. For us, like it make, makes sense to be in the Bay Area, and I think that we've benefited uh, uh, tremendously from that. But um, like nine-hour time zone difference is extremely, extremely hard. So regardless of Slack and and, and Hangouts uh, and all the technology that uh, that we have, it's a it's a it's a hard thing to uh, to pull off. Speci specifically, because we have development both in SF as well as Amsterdam. So there needs to be good communication between those those offices. That's quite hard. Why is that? Why 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 do you have it in both places? Well, our CTO is yeah. is from uh, from the Bay Area, so we, we hired some people around that. Uh, but yeah, they, they do need to, to communicate with each other, and it, uh, still, best way to do it is being in the same room. Yeah. Um, so that's kind of hard. I think it works better for um, so in the London case, even though that's a one hour time zone difference. That they you know, they have their own uh, mandate, so they do their own thing. Like you don't necessarily need a whole lot of communication with the with, with the with the rest of the team. So that's slightly easier. I mean, you hear different stories. Like there's a there's a lot of companies that are completely distributed, and it and it you know it works fine. Um, I guess it depends.
Right, so I'm gonna uh, round off with sort of one of the, the good old corny questions. Um, if there's any sort of piece of advice that you could give to uh, the next the next generation, or we'll say, of, uh, of entrepreneurs, um, what would that be? You can also make more than one if you feel uh, that's needed, but just one thing you would like to pass on. Yeah. So I, uh, we covered it. I think the focus is extremely important. Like do do one thing, solve it very well, and then start building on top of that. Um, talk to talk to your peers. Like it's a it's a even if you have a co-founder, like it's a pretty lonely lonely job. Um, so yeah, get you know have beers with other other startups and, and participate in, uh, in your community. <coughs> Mich, thanks a lot for uh, for a I hope this was kind of useful. Uh, absolutely, very useful. Thanks a lot. And uh, you stay around for yeah. some drinks. Okay. So if you guys want to ask more questions in person, uh, go ahead. Also, thanks for coming and uh, enjoy your weekend. Cheers. Cheers. Cheers.